to our channel, where we set out to explore wonderful great works of literature while dressed in elegant clothing, because... Oh, why the hell not? I <laughs> switched roles. Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> so, Alright, welcome back. So today, welcome back, and today we decided um, we take a well-known, beloved author of the gothic horror genre. Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker, a very famous Irish writer. Um, and we're not going to cover his most popular one, which will, of course would be Dracula. Uh, instead, we're going to look at his uh, Egyptian uh, Egyptian uh, novel entitled... The Jewel of Seven Stones. Stars. <laughs> the Jewel of Seven Stars. <laughs> I found it very difficult to actually try to remember I his joked. title. So. <laughs> I joked. Yeah, it was a good try, though. It was a good try. <laughs> yeah. So, this novel was written in 1903. And the ending has two versions. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, one, yeah. one we like, one was kind of like, one. yeah, right. We'll get into that a little bit later. But essentially, Bram Stoker studied at uh, uh, Trinity Dublin mm -hmm. um, College, and uh, he was very much interested in Egyptology. Um, and I would say it kind of comes through in this novel. Oh, yeah. Like, he's so well versed in sort of uh, ancient practices, rituals, even the whole chapter on the Ka. Like the Egyptian ka, <laughs> yeah. so there's the ka and there's the ba, and ka is like a life force that emanates throughout all sort of aspects of the body and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And he goes into grand detail there. I was actually quite impressed. Mm -hmm. So this is written in um, a... Yeah, what, what, what's so funny? Are you laughing at me? No, not about you. It's, uh, it's kind of like a fond de cercle sort of um, uh, take. Uh, obviously, this is during this period where... Um, Egyptian sort of like British colonial rule, mm -hmm. um, Egyptian antiquities were being brought into into England, uh, and there was like sort of an Egyptomania. Yeah, and so the, a fascination with uh, the East and the the Near East and the Far East, and so this is kind of around that period where a lot of mummy stories were being written. Um, I haven't read very many mummy stories. I think a lot of them would have been like pulp fiction stuff, mm -hmm. like nothing, mm -hmm. nothing highbrow. Not necessarily, not necessarily implying that this is highbrow. But Bram Stoker, um, you know, even though he wasn't particularly um, well received when he wrote Dracula first, and then he, and then later wrote this one, you know, he's still now considered part of some sort of Western canon, I suppose, of nineteenth-century writers. Yeah. Very, very, very enjoyable book. What were your impressions of it? It was really fun. It was, um, I, I actually was very surprised by the ending, both endings, like either ending he chose um, surprised me, but I think it, it was entertaining along the way. And yeah, you could tell he, Bram Stoker had definitely done his research on Egypt, oh, yeah. Egyptology. Yeah. Um, and he actually even references scholars, like, actually of the day. Yeah. You know, in, in sort of referencing their, their theories and, and their work. Do you remember any of them? I think, like, Budge. Walter Budge. I know yeah. one was yeah. Budge, I believe. Anyway, he was well known. Actually, one of the things we read up about this is that he was friends with Oscar Wilde's father. Who was also he was also he was he wasn't he was like kind of an amateur, uh, but he was quite an ex he was an explorer and he traveled, yeah, uh, you know, in these places quite frequently and had many stories and he was well read in sort of the, the, the their their literature. Yeah, and one of the stories was that they found a mummy in the desert, wasn't it? I think yeah, I think yeah. he found one of them, which yeah, is very mummy. similar to some of the storyline. Yeah. So do you want to get into the with the plot? How about you start with it and then I'll chime in when I feel like there's an important detail missing. You're better for the <laughs> memory with the details. All right. Okay. So um, essentially, um, Malcolm Ross is uh, the main protagonist. He's a barrister, not a particularly interesting fellow. I, I can I can imagine living in London. Um, he he has a he has a, a fascination with um, <laughs> this young lady, Margaret. Margaret. And her father is an Egyptologist, and um, one thing leads to another, and he ends up in the house of Margaret again, and her father. And Margaret just recently, for a year now, has been staying with her Egyptologist father, who's taken her in after a long estrangement. And he is, unfortunately, unconscious upstairs in one of the rooms, surrounded by all of these ancient antiquities, all this Egyptian paraphernalia, and um, nobody quite knows what's wrong with him. Yeah, and he wrote an expressed letter 
with, signed like with his lawyer, so it was a legitimate document provided to his daughter Margaret about how he did not want his body to be removed from that, from room. that room if he were to go unconscious. And and for nothing to be touched in that room yeah. either. Mm -hmm. So essentially later on he gets a wound and we th there's some sort of weird I I felt I felt that it was like this weird time lapse thing where things are frozen in place but things are still happening in these like incremental moments that you can't quite predict what you'll experience when you go into the room next. But they actually have some nurses come in, a physician gets involved, the police detective gets involved. And they start this like 24 hour operation yeah. where they're all monitoring sort of the status of like the health status of this, this Egyptologist. And because he has this whole will in a way where he has these set parameters of what he insists legally must be binding, um, nobody removes anything. And Margaret has this suspicion that something dreadful will happen if any of these things are not followed to the letter, mm -hmm. right? And it's very interesting because I think everyone at first just wants to figure out what's happened to, to the father. They they don't think there's anything to do with any of the Egyptian artifacts or anything supernatural happening. And then slowly over time, they realize that something else is going on. Something odd is happening. Should we get into what that odd thing is happening? Sure. It's not going to spoil very much. It's such an enjoyable read that you yeah. can just know the basic plot lines and still enjoy it as you're going through it. Queen Terra mm -hmm. was, um, a, um, uh, in this novel, is sort of this very um, powerful pharaoh, essentially. She was like, you know. Is it called a which, pharaoh or pharaoh? Yeah, it's Pharaoh. I guess like she was like a powerful ruler in Egypt mm -hmm. and her whole purpose was to uh, preserve her spirit where she actually kept it locked in this mummified cat. Essentially her kind of like spirit uh, was contained within this mummified cat and was actually using it as a vessel to actually, mm -hmm. you know, to, to stay preserved. Put her astral body in there, yeah. but yet her physical body was mummified differently than the stereotypical mummy where her organs were also still in place um, within her body, her cavity, which was obviously not, not unusual. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. unusual. Um, and then there was also things like lamp oil in, in canisters. So there's two lamps that were really important for this storyline too. And, and also peculiarly, there was this hand with seven fingers. Yeah. And, and, and it yeah. belonged to her, right? And essentially the father's like life had been dedicated to not just um not just egypt but Egyptolo egyptology but also a lot of his adventures and stories were around this queen tara and trying to res trying to bring her um her mummified body and sarcophagus back to where, where were they living london, london the time. yeah but the thing was it was her actual express intention it's not like he was trying to like revive it out of his own sense of you know yeah yeah ambition or whatever this was something that she had wanted to do she wanted to use his daughter essentially well, through her daughter to reincarnate we don't know that though for sure yeah, yeah she wanted to the, her whole purpose queen Terra, was to actually reincarnate reincarnate but we don't know if, we didn't know at, at that point if it was supposed to be through his daughter like there's no yeah there was, there was no like artifact or anything that said that it was going to be through another female body or right, anything right. like that in fact it almost seemed like her her tomb was set up for the the i don't know what do you call it reincarnation of the astral body yeah um in her tomb yeah so the fact that he was removing it wasn't an express wish of queen tara it was just that it was clear that she was was going to have some sort of resurrection yeah she had intended to, she planned it yes, specifically yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but then cycles. but then what what sean was sean was hinting at is that um there's some weird similarities between the daughter and queen tara and then you wonder okay mm. maybe when so the one of the stories is that as the main character the father's daughter was marguerite was being born um, he was moving the body. So I don't think it was a plan all along. I think there's some, like, that's my interpretation. I wonder if there's some sort of dark power happening as a vengeance against the father for moving the body. And oh, the whole time yeah. she was just hmm. trying to get back to her tomb where it was supposed to happen. But why else would she have all of her organs preserved? 
because the resurrection was supposed to happen within her tomb. That's the way I saw it. Mm. She was never supposed to be moved. And I do think there was a bit of arrogance. I don't think it was part of, like, it was the arrogance of the, of the father to think that he could be part of that process. Mm. Um, like, he discovered that that was obviously something that she was trying to do, was have her, her body resurrected. But I saw it as, like, kind of... You know, she, he tried to move the body. Each time it went missing, like weird things would happen to the jewel that was also, which is why it's called um, the Jewel of Seven Stars, because there was a seven-sided ruby. Was it yeah, ruby? Yeah, ruby. Yeah, that was also with her, and it would go, you know, she, she, her body wouldn't get, they kept how many times having to get the body, retrieve it again? Mm-hmm. How many times was mm-hmm. that? out of? So clearly she was trying to get back yeah. to her tomb. Yeah. So, um, anyway, do you want to go on with the No, no, go go ahead, go ahead. You're really, (laughs) really on point. (laughs) So then some dark stuff starts to happen. So as, as the the father is removing the body from the tomb and trying, you know, I don't know how many times they tried, they had to go back like three days, they, they make it and then they have to go back three days and then, you know, so much more time passed and almost they freeze at certain points. So they'd go under these trances where they wouldn't know how much time even passed yeah. within that time. And it would be like a week later and they would have been stuck inside of the tomb without time. So anyway, during the time when one of the attempts when the body was being moved, he finds out his daughter is being born. And so this is where I think that there was some sort of, yeah, dark magic happening on Queen Tara's behalf that something was happening because... Later on, we an awfully lot like Queen Tara. And she images. seems to be very like, uh, she seems to be almost very intuitive and ha- being almost like in the mind of Queen Tara herself. And, you know, there's this po- point where they sort of have her draped with uh, the, the linen which she was buried in. And, you know, her form is outlined by sort of the, this, uh, this linen that's covering her naked flesh. And so Margaret's in the room and she's like, oh no, like, you know, for propriety's sake, you you know, Don't take, to, yeah. all of these men watching sort of the, the vulnerability, vulnerable naked body of this Queen Tara, like she doesn't like that or if there's something where she felt yeah. very uncomfortable. Yeah. So they had to allay some of her concerns there. But yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it kind of like uh, this great experiment ends up uh, taking place where the father comes up with his grand plan to somehow I believe reincarnate essentially or help bring that process about for Queen Tara. So for a while you're in the dark as the reader. Like you don't really know why is he in this room. We just see the weird things happening. There's seven um, like claw marks on his body. They think at first it's the cat of um, the Margaret's Margaret's cat and it can't possibly be that. And then eventually, you know, this happens a number of times where they're setting up all these experiments trying to to figure out what's happening and then they realize that there's some sort of power within that room in fact they identify it as an odor an there's odor. like a mummified yeah. smell like a musty smell so they end up wearing like these face masks oxygen or, masks yeah, oxygen um masks. so that they can stay awake otherwise for example the maid also went into this weird stupor and paralysis nurses, and, and almost didn't survive like um and then there's always this sense that there's something in the room and things are moving and mm-hmm. you know all of a sudden there's a wound which you don't even see happen yeah and i found that to be the most like unpleasantly eerie yeah sort of visualization you know like everything seems frozen in place almost like time locked Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden like some wound just appears like in a blink of an eye and then like someone can die or or something horrible could happen or a dismemberment or i don't know it was just very unnerving but everyone concludes that the only time something happens is when the daughter's in the room, mm-hmm. which is why everyone except for the, the main character, Malcolm, is suspicious of her. And they also find these lamps of another explorer in her, coincidentally, in her bedroom after he had said, said that they were, it, they were gone missing. Yeah. So some weird things are happening. And then you start to wonder, is she really like Queen Terror? Has she already been possessed from birth? It, like Sean was saying, was she just being prepared or groomed from the beginning to be the the body of the astral body of Tara? Yeah. And like her mother died in childbirth too. So there's some weird things around that. And then finally the father comes to, right? It comes mm. to, and then this is when this agreement great. happens to further try to resurrect this body. And then the plans come forward that, that great experiment, that this is the great experiment. Yeah. So then... And so essentially that's the final, the final conclusion where, you know, either the ex- there's two versions, either the experiment, well, 
works or doesn't work. They say mm -hmm. in the second version, which was written in 1912, the experiment didn't work. And it was kind of like a happier ending, which is apparently very typical of Bram Stoker to end it in a more optimistic note, a more mm -hmm. cheerful note. So, you know, um, you know, they all have their masks on in the room, some, something breaks through the, through the window or anyway, something, something happens, something or other happens. It's not very, it's quite vague in the description, but essentially, you know, they end up nullifying the resurrection um, of Queen Terra. And then, and then Malcolm and Margaret get married. Get married and, and, that, like, and happy, 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 happy ending. Happy, happy joy, joy. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> fine. But the, the original one, which was obviously written in 1903, was much darker. Much and darker I, and rapidly darker. Like, uh, yeah. I, I would say it was like a kind of, there's some spooky elements to it, but by the, for the most part, you know, it was very like pretty light and you wouldn't expect like it to be as cruel and dark of an ending. Yeah. Do you want to? Well, I just felt it was like rather shocking. Mm -hmm. So especially for something in the 19th century where, you know, there, there was a sense in which they kind of like, you know, tamed a lot of their sort of, uh, their graphic sort of, uh, you know, graphic representations of violence or horror. Uh, anyway, so everyone dies essentially, except yeah, for Malcolm. Malcolm. Malcolm and he's like, I, and the whole time he was like, it's true up until that point, he'd been like, aren't you afraid that Tara is gonna take over Margaret's mm -hmm. body and like just, become possessed by them says and, every, the father. and at that point yeah it says this to the father and the father and margaret both were at that point didn't even seem like phased by the idea which was also spooky and weird like why they, they're just like oh if that happens this was the purpose of our life kind of thing but that it didn't seem like from the reader's perspective it didn't seem like it was even margaret speaking anymore is it margaret or marguerite margaret margaret, margaret. okay yeah, yeah, it didn't yeah. even seem like margaret was speaking you yeah know? It seemed like at that point because the full moon and all these special coordinates in the astrological charts had been lined up for yeah, this yeah. event to happen. Like they had calculated it perfectly. So yeah. it seemed at that point, it was already like the process of the astral body reincarnating was already, yeah. It. So Malcolm wasn't listening to his instinct and then, you know, and ends up like not just dead, but like quite like they had terror in their eyes. Yeah. Right? Like when a they, whore in their eyes. Just like these, Margaret's dead. Stat sort of, statues. Yeah, like one one of the Doctor Winchester was one of the physicians on call there. The father was dead. Mm -hmm. There was some other person who was I don't know if it was a constable or someone else was mm -hmm. in the room there. It was like, whoa! It was heavy. It was like one of those things where you just finish it and you're like, I need to like, yeah. I need a stiff drink after this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. it was good. Like I liked that ending because it was so shocking. You know, like, yeah. I don't know. I thought that that was neat. The, in this edition, they contain both uh, mm, both versions, which is cool. and they put the, the the most graphic one, the first one, you know, at the beginning. Well, like first, and then and then they finally conclude with the second version, and it was just so anticlimactic after yeah. like watching, listening to the second one, and it so. almost seemed like. He, the, like Bram Stoker wasn't even really enjoying it. Yeah. Like, I think it was like yeah. almost like it was a request for him to edit it. It was like the critics didn't quite like it, and yeah. I think he felt compelled by his publishers to do yeah. so. Yeah. But it's just like you can tell just even reading it, he just kind of like, okay, I'm gonna put all the cookie cutter pieces, close it up in a nice little bow, and then yeah. let's just yeah. end this thing, right? Yeah. Okay, you want this? Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, like but, that's it. Did seem like that to me. But what's interesting, what we read about it is apparently, like um, Bram Stoker wasn't popular even with Dracula until like the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, where it got a resurgence of that with like uh, mm -hmm. cultural criticism and all this sort of academic disciplines coming in and just kind of reviewing it for its significance. And the same thing goes, and even I would say, like same thing goes with this novel. Mm -hmm. You know, it was also kind of like not exactly uh, accepted openly with arms wide open essentially when yeah. it first came out but i do think it, it deserves you know more attention today it, it was actually yeah, a fun read it's a really fun read yeah something to break up sort of the the hardcore classic yeah yeah definitely it's definitely out of the ordinary for classics i would say yeah yeah how would you rate it oh i'm gonna give it a 4.6 yeah i would say 4.5 a solid 4.5 out of 5. <laughs> I think it was really enjoyable. Definitely highly recommend it. Uh, especially, I would say, you know, in the coming summer months, you want to read something more adventurous, something more, uh, it has a nice sort of like feel of the ancient and the and the, the occult and mm -hmm. sort of mysterious. 
And definitely your go-to. This is definitely going to be one of your go-tos. All right. Well. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And we hope you have a pleasant evening. Yes. And uh, hopefully a mysterious dreams about Egyptian gods. Wow. That's that's quite that's quite serious. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, you take care. <laughs> have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.